This is Bill B. Now read a second time. I call the member for Balmain. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I uh, rise to address the Waste Avoidance and Resource Recovery Amendment contained in the Deposit Scheme 2016, following on from the contributions that other members have made, including my two Greens colleagues, who have outlined the fact that we are generally supportive of this legislation, and we're delighted that we've come to a point in time when we can talk about contained deposit where we can talk about uh, waste minimisation, where we can talk about extended producer responsibility, and we can start the debate uh, about how we manage waste uh, and packaging products in our wider community. Uh, first of all, to follow on from the positive comments that people have made, it's always nice to start in the positive. I do want to recognise all of those members who have stood up to the beverage industry, because the truth is the beverage industry has run a disgraceful a uh, uh, campaign of misinformation, of intimidation, of bullying, of legal, expensive legal tactics against anybody who's tried to support container deposit legislation. We saw it in the Northern Territory, in the Northern Territory where their government decided to introduce a container deposit scheme that Lion Nathan, that Swepps and Coca-Cola ganged up on that government uh, to, to go, uh, to take that matter to court and on a uh, jurisdictional technicality outlaw, um, uh, ensure that that wasn't able to proceed at that time. We've seen in this state the bullying of the beverage industry against the, the Liberal government, and we saw them do that against the former state Labor government. Um, threats of campaigns, in fact campaigning with total falsehoods in the media, spending uh, significant amounts of money in radio and other areas to campaign against this common sense step, all to defend the vested interests of the polluting and environmental destructive beverage industry, who put forward embarrassing embarrassing programs like Coca-Cola's National Bin Network, which was a joke. I mean, anybody with any common sense outside of the echo chamber of the beverage industry would have known that that could not fly. And then, of course, most recently we had their Thirst for Good campaign, which this government and anyone with any common sense saw through as a tokenistic fig leaf over an issue which can be addressed so easily with contained deposit legislation. I also want to acknowledge John Williams the National Party member um, from the Murray-Darling, who boarded South Australia, who was very active on this issue, and he's no longer in this House, but it's important to recognise him and the National Party that had a long-standing policy supporting this. Other members that we've already heard, uh, many Liberals who have been supportive of this, Ian Keenan, the lobby groups like Greenpeace, Total Environment Centre, importantly the Boomerang Alliance, who have taken a, a very important stand in this campaign, and, uh, and all of those in the community, most importantly, who have fought so hard to have a common-sense approach towards uh, containers and how we manage containers in New South Wales. I remember uh, in the former Labor government when we saw a ray of hope. The former car government commissioned the Institute for Sustainable Futures at UTS to want to take a review and to look at a feasibility study into container deposit legislation, as was known at that time. And what happened? Uh, Premier Carr came out and ruled out container deposit legislation before the review had even been completed. The beverage industry effectively nobbled the former Labor government and we have seen attempts uh, to do that. And those of you on the inside of the Nats and Liberals will know that the beverage industry threatened the government with a big campaign against them. Oh, we're going to run a huge campaign and say so we're going to put up the price of milk and water and everything else. Well, the government did the right thing. The government recognised good common sense policy should overcome uh, rent seekers and those supporting environmental destruction in our community. So I want to acknowledge the efforts of all of those, including the minister, uh, the current minister and the former minister, Minister Stokes, because this does enact a commitment the government made and um, it, does, it does provide what, in broad terms, the government committed to undertake. Now, we know there's been issues raised in the House today about uh, some of the concerns. I want to talk, first of all, about some of the good things. Some of the good things, of course, is it can includes three-litre containers. There was some discussion about whether three litres was viable, uh, but to include three litres, in my view, is important. And the breadth of the amount of beverage containers, while it's not as wide as many of us would like, it's still significant and will make a very large inroad into dealing with container waste. The objects of the bill, they're strong. They relate to the responsibility that the beverage industry has in dealing with its waste, extended producer responsibility, and of course that needs to be extended in so many other areas, whether it's in the products that are produced by industry, whether it's the packaging, white goods packaging, a whole range of other packaging where extended producer responsibility needs to be implemented because we know the National Packaging Covenant is an embarrassing joke. It's a joke. Anyone who can see when it's driven by the industry, run by the industry, it has a pathetic impact in terms of overall reduction in the use of packaging, in terms of minimising 
but also when it comes to the issue of uh, waste management, because the industry loves the fact that ratepayers pay to dispose of their garbage. They love that. Of course they would like ratepayers to continue to dispose of waste that they produce. They don't want to have any responsibility for the waste that they produce. They want to get taxpayers to pay for that. And what this does, it starts the process of saying to producers, you need to be responsible for what you do, and the environment shouldn't take the full impact of your packaging decisions, and you need to be a little bit more responsible. We need to see that, of course, and I mentioned white goods, when it comes to white goods and electronics, about how we manage those, an incredible cost to the community to dispose of the products which have been produced by other areas, other manufacturers and other industries. And we see in, in countries which have a more advanced view uh, than Australia does, that people are producing electronic equipment and white goods with recyclable components, with components that can easily be dismantled so products can be recycled and reused again. In countries like Australia where we don't have those strong rules, products are created which meet the legislative environment, which means they are not recyclable, they're very difficult to dismantle, they're toxic, they're difficult to dispose of, and who pays for the disposal of that? The environment and we as taxpayers. What other jurisdictions around the world have decided is that producers need to take more responsibility for what they make so it can be more easily disposed of, and this is part of that overall uh, theme which is uh, working around the world. And of course, we've seen other members talk about that with plastic bags single-use, under 35 micron plastic bags is another example of areas where the government can act. Uh, we do have some concerns, Mr Speaker, um, that there does need to be some more regular reporting than annual reporting. We know in other jurisdictions the reporting is quarterly, and the member for um, the Ballina indicated that in the other place we'd be addressing uh, amendments to go to that matter. There's no re requirement for retailers to advertise the scheme or provide information on nearest, where the nearest collection point is. We think that's a common sense amendment, that there should be a requirement for them to at least advertise and indicate where collection points are. Um, the advisory committees are welcome, Mr Speaker, but there's no requirement for any kind of environmental expertise. And of course we know the beverage industry are seeking to stack out every committee they can to try and run a rearguard action to defeat this government's um, proposals. There's also no clear prohibition on the scheme coordinator operating, operating as a network operator. So we think that those two roles, those functions, should be separate to provide for uh, independence and integrity of the scheme. And we would encourage the Minister to address that issue about uh, why there's no prohibition for the scheme coordinator and network operator to be separated. We think that would encourage a more effective scheme. We're also concerned that the scheme coordinator bears the entire financial risk for the scheme, not the beverage companies, and we think there should be opportunities there to spread that risk, to mitigate risk, to make sure the scheme can be as robust as possible. And finally, we've heard some discussion about this already, Mr Speaker, about large retailers not being required to be involved in the scheme, despite them being normally the most cost-efficient uh, place to return empty containers. I refer the Speaker, uh, if I may, Mr Speaker, I refer the House to a letter from the Boomerang Alliance on the 5th of October addressed to members, and it talks about in great detail, and I'm sure the, the Minister would have addressed this, uh, would have examined this from all the 44 allied groups in the Boomerang Alliance, that the only tried and tested approach to deliver the high-performing, cost-effective CDS is to place obligations on large beverage retailers, like supermarkets, to ensure a collection point will be found at every major shopping centre across the globe, and I'm quoting from this document, the evidence is clear that 10 of the 13 jurisdictions that adopted CDS in the past decade have clear retailer obligations to ensure collection coverage resulting in an average 86.75 return rate by comparison to three jurisdictions that relied on the market-driven approach, which we're looking at in this bill, Northern Territory, Hawaii and Newfoundland, have been rife with problems and perform at only around 62.5%. So the government should not listen to the beverage industry and should recognise that if there's some type of obligation for the large beverage retailers to have a recycling, have a collection point, we know the performance of the scheme will be greatly enhanced. If we're going to have the scheme and go through this whole process, we need to have an efficient and effective scheme. So, Mr Speaker, can I conclude by thanking all those members who have spoken, all those who have been supportive of the scheme. The member for Dremoyne here is one of them, and other members, the member for Oatley has spoken, uh, the member for Coogee. So many members have been supportive of this scheme, and I really urge the Minister to hold fast and make sure that the integrity of the scheme isn't undermined by the beverage industry and their disgraceful tactics to attack environmental uh, initiatives and conservation in our state. So I applaud uh, um, all those staff in the Minister's office and in the department that have worked so hard on it, and I offer the support um, of myself and the Greens for this bill.